Hey, welcome back to the food forest. It's been a while since my last video, roughly a month. It's not that I haven't been trying to make videos. Now that we're getting into the off season of gardening, I like to get into some of the Activision stuff and give updates on recent climate science and things that we should care about, things that are going on in the world. It's just that lately a lot of it's really depressing. It's very hard for me to make a video um, and not have it come across as negative. What I really want in this channel is to empower people to uh, care about the things that are happening in the world and then go out and drive action to fix them. That's the whole point of this channel. I teach gardening because agriculture is roughly a third of our greenhouse gas emissions and gardening is a really good way to increase your health, both physical and mental, to improve nature, to uh, help out animals other than human beings, but also to save money so that as society, we can actually support other projects. If everyone is just scraping by, it's really hard to fund the stuff that we need to fund, the big picture stuff. And it's also an area where we can actually focus on unity and coming together because we all know that the world and you know media wants to drive us apart in arguing. A lot of what is going on right now is depressing from that perspective. We're seeing a lot of people looking sideways, left and right, to find where their enemies are and then argue with them. Meanwhile, we should all be kind of joining hands and looking up. You know, a lib left blue haired city dweller has a lot in common with a uh, rural right based hardcore staunch conservative or Republican and probably more than the media would make us out to believe because our commonality is that we actually love the planet that we live on and we want to preserve it. My goal with this channel to teach gardening is to get that unity building and get us agreeing on things so that we can get going on solving the things that we need to solve. It's just been really hard lately. In the climate science realm, we've got new research out like the Hansen et al. paper. Um, we've got the uh, climate sensitivity analysis update that is looking extremely troubling and helps explain why some of this stuff is happening faster than expected. We hear that phrase all the time and this is one of the reasons why. It turns out that modeling supercooled liquid water inside clouds is a really, really complicated thing. It's basically chaos theory and we're doing our best with models and not just a lot of people think that there's a climate model. There's actually like 80 plus climate models all integrated into each other. One of the things that's really difficult to actually analyze and model is the chaotic nature of how clouds both nucleate and form, store energy, what happens with the water vapor in them, aerosol effects and how that impacts the Earth's albedo, things like that. We're learning more and more about them, refining our models and finding out that things which are like the large outputs of the climate models, like climate sensitivity numbers, are kind of really out of whack. Now, before I discuss what a climate sensitivity number is, I also want to talk about some of the other things I'm going to speak in this video, which is uh, transportation. It's an area where I haven't done a whole lot of videos on, and I really want to hit it because it's one of the most important um, ways that we can reduce our carbon. And it's one of the ways that I think the green movement is really disjointed from reality. And it's because the green movement is really corrupted by corporate and business policies, like everything is. A lot of people will complain that the green movement is all about making money, as though the other side, you know, the oil and gas industry is like the most philanthropic uh, industry on the planet and that they are not concerned with making money. Hey, newsflash, everyone wants to make money. And if there's a new business venture that opens up, if there's a new, whole new sector of economy that opens up, well, you better believe that business is going to try to make money with it. One of the things I'm going to talk about in a future video is actually the difference between saving transportation using EVs, which is kind of where everyone's gearing towards. Convert all the ICE vehicles to EVs and ignore the fact that car-centered infrastructure and city design is really the root cause of a lot of the transportation problems. Proper city design in order to address climate change and meet climate goals needs to be focused on increased walking, uh, increased biking, and specifically moving people out of single vehicles into mass transportation. And where you can't have mass transportation, stuff like an e-bike is actually probably 
the most impactful thing we can do for reducing transportation emissions. The green grid assumption is actually a really important one where there's a lot of misinformation out there in the EV. This is another area where I found it very difficult to make videos on this without getting frustrated because there's new studies coming out that, you know, large SUV and truck electric vehicles will actually be worse for the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions cradle to grave than a very small ICE vehicle like a Hyundai Accent or something like that. And when you dig into the analysis, not only do you see that they're comparing apples to oranges, they're comparing, you know, large SUVs to a small vehicle, but they're also charging the SUVs in the in the assumptions of the analysis. They're charging them with coal and natural gas. It's just, it's frustrating when you see the amount of lobbying and concerted effort there is in order to disrupt a technology that could potentially help the human race. That being said, there is something to say for that. I'm gonna get into a study here in a little bit to kind of put out the real numbers so you can understand that this is just not even remotely true, that EVs are way better than ICE cars. But that being said, I really don't believe the solution is that everybody buys a Tesla. First off, economically, a lot of people financially just can't afford a Tesla. It's ridiculous to even just assume that that's going to be something in this economic reality that we find ourselves in for people to do. However, when the government's giving out subsidies for electric vehicles, I think that that money could have been better spent giving people in urban environments subsidies or even just giving them an e-bike. And because this is such an impactful way to reduce transportation emissions, I've actually gone out of my way to try to contact uh, e-bike manufacturers and create a deal brand that I can do. So coming up in the future, hopefully, there's going to be a sponsorship video on one of the best e-bike brands and hopefully I can get you a good deal and people who are watching this and want to make a difference um, in our transportation sector. Maybe you live in an urban environment and you can't grow food, you can't do some of these things. You can still reduce your impact and it makes a huge difference. If you can reduce your transportation impact by taking mass transportation, by walking, biking, and for longer distances, taking an e-bike, then that is a huge impact. And if everybody did that, we would find ourselves in a much better situation to address the challenges that we face in the next 10 years. So look forward to that. Hopefully I can get a good deal for you guys on getting into an e-bike or an e-scooter. Something like that can be so tremendously impactful. Okay, so just quickly, um, it's a day later, I want to pull up some of these studies just to show you here. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, this here is a publication on cradle to grave emissions of electric vehicles compared to ICE vehicles. Uh, and they also even use like ethanol vehicles where you basically burn biofuels like corn. And in here, there's this figure, it's a pretty good uh, graph, and it shows you the difference between certain assumptions that are used in different models. So on the axis, you've got greenhouse gas emissions, which is a CO2 equivalent per mile driven per passenger in the vehicle as well. Um, and then we've got, you know, gas vehicles are way up here, the worst you can get. Uh, we've got diesel, we've got combined natural gas, that's what this stands for. This is the ethanol vehicle, E85, so it's 85% ethanol. Arrows here are kind of technologies that could, in the future, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So this is one reason I really like this study, uh, because they don't just look at what the picture looks like today, they actually look at what future tech could actually do for dropping some of these down. Um, we've got hydrogen cars, um, combined cycle, and we've got different size uh, battery EVs. So this is like, you know, your Tesla's uh, Model 3, and then this might be like, you know, your Tesla Model S or Model X. So you can see there's a big difference between um, the SUVs, uh, trucks, and the smaller, you know, Nissan Leaf, um, Tesla Model 3, those things. You can see here, the blue is the production burden of CO2, and they look at all types of materials that go into it, from uh, mining, transportation, assembly, all of that. But you can see that today, even the worst offenders of battery vehicles, the largest battery vehicles, are still twice as good as a typical gasoline um, vehicle. And then you've got Model 3, for example, which is a little more than twice as good. And then even when we allow for future tech, 
when we allow for cleaner grid to you know charge the EVs that draws the numbers down further so this is uh, charging with the current mix this was done in the US so the current US electrical mix which has a lot of dirty power in it I live in Ontario in Ontario we have a very very clean grid so when I'm driving my model 3 I'm getting a much lower footprint than somebody who is powering the grid off of coal and then you're burning coal to create electricity there's waste there and then you're using that electricity to then charge a, an EV that's just not really the way to do it but you know it's really this dirty grid assumption that that is really driving this when you start powering EVs with uh, solar panels it's just not even remotely close nothing's touching um, you know a, a nice efficient electric vehicle powered with um, powered with solar tech uh, now that being said we can still vastly improve like this number 150 uh, grams of co2 per mile and if you want to get two per kilometer you just divide it by 1.6 okay so this is r roughly around 100 uh, per per kilometer uh, it's nowhere near as good as scooters so here's another assessment of life cycle assessment of scooters so this study looked at a bunch of scenarios and then it averaged them out and the results show that for PEOS, which is a like, personal um, electrically operated scooter or personally electrically uh, like owned uh, electric scooter. So it's basically differentiating between um, a personal scooter that you would use yourself versus like a ride sharing program. So a personal scooter uh, emits roughly 21 grams of CO2 per kilometer. And if you want to get that into miles, multiply it by 1.6. And then that's compared to eight grams for a bike and then 40 grams for a e-bike. And battery EVs, it says here is roughly 80, and this is because they're using clean grid assumptions. So 80 here for a battery EV, you can see that sometimes there are, you know, on the low side, it, it's even lower. So what's the true number? Probably between 80 and 150 for an EV, and you're around 40 for an e-bike. So what that means is that as good as EVs are, and they're twice as good as an ICE vehicle, riding an e-bike is even better and an e-scooter is double as good as an e-bike and when you compare it to biking you know probably the cleanest thing we can get it's only about twice as bad as biking specifically if you're charging it with solar or or, or a green grid nuclear as well so i really do think that the solution to reducing a third of our emissions in the transportation sector is more mass transportation more biking um, cities designed where you can bike safely cities designed around ways where it's not a car centered infrastructure and then allowing people to um, have the infrastructure required to charge an e-bike or an e-scooter super important going forward in the future some areas like where i live in the gta the greater toronto area we can have rural areas that feed into larger city centers in terms of people going to work and the only way you can kind of do that is with, with cars. So more mass transportation there, but a really big thing is to actually expand work from home so that we reduce the amount of people actually needing to drive in. Some jobs can't work from home, for example. However, any job that can, we should really be focusing on making sure that those people have the ability to do so. For you, if you live in a city or a small suburb area, any kind of transportation that you can offset by riding an e-bike goes a long way in order to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, stay tuned for um, a video on a sponsorship deal that is 90% done and uh, just finishing out the details of that and I hope I can get that to you soon. So probably my next video will be on that uh, e-bike and e-scooter. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this one. Hope you uh, can resist some of the misinformation that is out there specifically on electric vehicles. Just remember there's a lot of money to be made here and uh, you, you have industries that don't want to be disrupted and they're going to put out science and pseudoscience and misinformation to try to drive their agenda. A lot of people complain about the green industry being all about money, money, money. <laughs> I, 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 I don't doubt that that's happening. It's just it's happening everywhere. And I think it's worse on the other side. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.
The minute I'm back in the White House, not only will I impose the most crippling sanctions in history, we will also unleash the most powerful economic weapon. We will drill, baby, drill. 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 Drill, baby, drill.